రేఖా యూ షుడ్ స్టార్ట్ అయితే a very pleasant good afternoon to each one of the participants who have joined us from across the length and breadth of our country i rekha sharma sen on behalf of the association for early childhood education and development welcome each one of you to our second webinar this year today we will deliberate on a topic of critical importance for all of us early childhood professionals which is the nurturing care framework launched by the world health organization in 2018 we will be understanding the framework within the national as well as global perspective <laughs> from the point of view of typical child development in a second webinar which we will be organizing or so down the line we will be looking at how the framework supports us to engage with children with disabilities and to promote their optimal development and inclusion in early childhood development settings to take us on our learning journey today we have with us as our speaker none other than the eminent developmental pediatrician dr samir h dalwai who practices at the new horizons child development center at mumbai he is the treasurer of the indian academy of pediatrics the academy launched a national program of nurturing care for early childhood development in 2021 and dr dalwai has been appointed as its national coordinator despite the covid situation the academy conducted 180 workshops training more than 6000 pediatricians across the country following the success of this national endeavor dr dalwai was invited to contribute to a who meeting in geneva in november 2023 which was regarding development of a toolkit for the nurturing care framework presently he is also coordinating the academy and unicef collaboration which plans to extend the nurturing care framework to children with autism today our webinar is in two parts in the first shorter part we will be releasing a publication of our association which is based on the international virtual conference which was organized in 2022 The book release will be done by the president of our association, Professor Vrinda Datta, and our guest for today, Dr. Samir Dalwal. Professor Vrinda Datta was at the School of Human Ecology at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, where she was engaged in teaching, publication, and research. And subsequently, she was also the director of the Center for Early Childhood Education and Development at the Ambedkar University of Delhi. Before I invite Professor Datta and Dr. Dalwai to release the book, a few slides about what our association is all about for those of you who may have joined us for the webinar for the first time today. The Association for Early Childhood Education and Development is a registered association, and we collaborate with government at state and national levels. For example, we were part of the nationwide. effort to provide feedback on the national education policy our national office is at the tata institute of social sciences we organize conferences seminars parent webinars network with organizations working in the field of ecct and we also acknowledge good practices through our spotlight webinars in which many of you may have participated our branches engage in consultancy refresher courses networking parent connect advocacy we also bring out e newsletters and these are sent to all the members and we invite any one of you to contribute or let us know about your good practices which can be reflected in our newsletters if any one of you would like to join us which i'm sure you would want to here are our details we are there on the our membership is both institutional and individual Uh, for one, three, and five years, the membership forms are available at our website www. aecd. dot dot uh, in. I think that is or two dot in. And our email, our contact addresses. Please take a screenshot of this. Our you could contact us on email through the website. Yeah, the website is www. dot aecd. dot org. dot in. At Facebook, at LinkedIn, at YouTube. you could also take the two telephone numbers in case you would like to contact us by phone we really look forward to all of us joining uh, joining yeah. 
I now invite Professor Vrinda Datta and Dr. Dalwai to do the honors and release the book. Thank you, Rekha. Uh, though Rekha has introduced uh, Dr. Samir Dalwai, I would like to say a few words. I, I want to say that Dr. Samir Dalwai is the friend of AECED. Yeah, <laughs> because I remember long back uh, in 2005, I met you first and we were IAP and you came to join us and discuss about uh, uh, something about testing of children and what can we do about it and so on. So that's when you I first met you and then on I think IAP AECD has been in partnership with you for various things, whether it's workshops uh, or anything. When I was in TISS, I think I was ever grateful to Dr. Samir Dalwai for opening his doors to New Horizons for our students. And you will all not believe he gave us 10 years data to analyze and write scientific papers. Nobody does that, but he gave us the uh, freedom to use all the data which he had about his ch children. So I'm ever grateful for to Samir for sharing and making learning so meaningful from uh, uh, for so long. So thank you so much. And today it is a privilege to have you here to release our first publication. And we are very pr proud and happy of this uh, uh, achievement. Uh, you know, uh, AECD has done many conferences, maybe six, eight conferences. And every time we do an in-house uh, kind of a report, which just gets circulated among the participants. But this time it was different. This conference generated global and national knowledge and practices regarding a topic which we have not done uh, for a long time. But that is how how does the crisis situation impact, uh, especially the situation of pandemic, impact the children? And what do we do to, in, to change systems, to change policies and practices that we can still continue to give optimal environments for children? So all these things came out as new and rich knowledge, which was uh, discussed in the conference. That's when AEC decided that this time we need to take this and disseminate across the nation and everywhere because this is new work and new information which is national and global. The comprehensive report is based on our conference which happened for three days across uh, three, uh, four teams and uh, we had nearly 40-45 experts talking in plenary sessions, workshops, uh, paper presentations, voices from the all these uh, were very rich in whatever they had contributed. So this report is a presentation of all what happened in terms of presentations and the discussions that took place about these topics. I think this document is going to be very useful for everybody who's in the field of ECD, whether you are an academician, researcher, practitioner, policymaker, teacher, principal. There is something for everybody. And I hope this book will be um, used by all of you uh, because this is, I think, uh, uh, the contents of this book is something which is not easily available in the Indian context about what happened during the pandemic with children and how programs and people have responded to it. Uh, I'm happy to inform that this book is going to be available at Amazon from 20th February. And it will be priced at 450 for a hard copy and 150 for an online copy. So do please uh, uh, look into this. I also want to take this opportunity to, talk, uh, to thank the White Falcon publishers for being with us uh, and cooperating and coordinating our efforts to bring out this publication. The executive committee of the AECD has been uh, very supportive and uh, has taken this activity very seriously, which I thank them for. I think I must mention that Sumitra Mishra, who has been the uh, from Mobile Crishes, who have been the partner for the conference, have also contributed a lot towards this report. We had a publication committee led by Nandita, 
and the team had Sujata, Rajni, Swati, and Deepishka. Thank you for putting so much effort and your valuable time in creating this report. And uh, I request all the participants today to do uh, take a look at the book and hope you will buy it and enjoy reading it. May I request Samir, Dr. Samir Dadwali to release the book and say a few words? Sure. Shall we do the book release first? Yeah, sure. Unfortunately, we won't hear the applause, but... <laughs> <laughs> What's life without a little imagination? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, at least three, four of us can clap. So, here it yes. is. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, shall I uh, proceed? Yeah, please do say a few words. Yes. Say a few words okay. about the book. Yes, yes. So, uh, good evening, Dr. Datta, Dr. Arikash Sharma. Mrs. Contractor, all my other dear friends from ASEC, as it was rightly said, I've been honored and proud to be a part of all of you. And I miss Dr. Ms. Nalini Ma'am, who was the first person who I met into this organization. <laughs> and all of you are here today, so good evening. And first and foremost, I'm very happy to be have given the honor to uh, release this wonderful document, I'm going to call it, because this has a trove of knowledge on two parts. One is about what happened during COVID and after COVID and how to come back. But when I went through it deeply, it actually is essential knowledge which hasn't really changed due to COVID or anything very different. But what I think COVID did was it made us stop the crazy speed at which we were running and look back at what has happened, what has happened well, what has perhaps not gone so well and re-look at the fundamentals. And I went through this, when I went through this, I think the document, this is a document of what actually is age-old learning, but with the precision of a closer look now because we have come out of COVID. But this but, I would say holds true even before COVID, and hence we have gone through even a few years when COVID is no longer hopefully on the scene. I like the way that chapters were the, the entire proceedings were covered in how everybody was, that each topic was uh, spoken of in detail and also the abstracts in the presentation, so much to say that actually had I seen this doc book before, I would not have agreed for today's talk because everything that I wanted to say is more or less covered in this wonderful book. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just keep it a little light, go through a lot of material because the topic is such that we have to look at perspectives all over. And we will just touch on a few things as we go by. So we'll cover a lot of material, but we won't go into depths on anything because most of it is self-explanatory. If there is any discussion needed, we can always go back in the later question hour. But before I proceed, I would like to say how it, it's always an amazing thing to be to learn from the legends. And Dr. Datta, the way she spoke as if I have done something great, I was so touched by it because the truth was, we had been working in child development. We had four or five centers that time. Now we have six. We have an online division. But the truth be told, we were just clinicians, like a doctor's clinic. A typical doctor also does Sardi Khasi. We were doing development and autism, ADHD. There was no research angle behind it. But when she came in and she said that, Samir, what you are doing is amazing. But where is it published? Where is the academic orientation of it? And the scientific committee will not recognize it unless it is published. So actually, I mean, I was surprised she was thanking me. I was, I'm the person who should be thanking her because my first publication came out as the entire, I had that journal right here somewhere. I can't as usual find it when you need it the most. It's right there on my table. A comprehensive analysis of 1301 children whom we had seen at New Horizons from 2009 to 2013 across those four or five years of 1301 children and I am so grateful because that was our first publication. And that actually set us off on the road. And now we have quite a lot of publications, which are more in the area of developmental pediatrics. So the next time, the next talk that we have, I believe next month, that you've been kind enough to invite me for, we'll be focusing on my core work, that is 
developmental neurodevelopmental disorders and developmental pediatrics but today uh, we are going to confine ourselves to a very interesting topic which perhaps relates to each and every child and not just the children who are affected by neurodevelopmental disorders so if you will just give me a minute and permit me i'll go on to sharing my screen just a moment While Dr. Dalvai is sharing his screen, this was a shot of the book and where it is available. Maybe you could show for half a second again, uh, Gregory, while Dr. Dalvai is still arranging his Yeah, yeah, go for it. Thanks. Thanks, Vedana. All right. So, yeah. shall I share the screen? Absolutely, Dr. Vedana. We are waiting. Eagerly looking forward to understanding. Thank you. Thank you. And its implications for us as early childhood professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vedana. All right. So thanks again, and Dr. Uh, Purnima ma'am and Dr. Rika ma'am for having spent so much of time coordinating all this in the last few weeks that we've been doing this. And we are going to look at the nurturing care framework for early childhood development, the national and global, global perspectives. And I'm going to speak largely as a pediatrician today, and I really like this entire uh, artwork that you all had done, and why, and I'm going to quote what you've written. While we try to teach our children all about life, our children teach us what life is all about. I absolutely agree with that and I'm sure everybody does. Only thing that we need to remember is we can't take it too literally at all. Because in the early childhood development stage, though we have to obviously have responsive caregiving is what is going to be the main part of my talk. At the same time, there is some core knowledge that we, as people working in the field, as people with years and years of experience. And what is experience if not the ability to learn from your mistakes? If you don't make mistakes, you won't have experience. And if you are experienced, that means you made plenty of mistakes. But children cannot be subjected to mistakes. And hence, if adults have learned from those mistakes, it is incumbent upon us to try and take the best of what we already know to the child. And this is absolutely essential and as essential a subject as the nurturing care framework, which is made by adults for early childhood development, which is of course for the child. Having said this, why is it so important? Because if you look at the basic science of it, and I'm not going to talk much about that and you know bore everybody. If you look at neurobiological outcomes of all developmental work, if you see the first basic part is synaptogenesis, when two neurons connect to each other or decide to hold hands, they do so across a point where they connect to each other and hold hands, where I call it a handshake or a synapse. And this process of forming multiple synapses of multiples and trillions of neurons in the brain is called synaptogenesis. And I am very deliberately bringing this about right at the beginning of the talk because there would be no ECD, there would be no nurturing care framework if there was no synaptogenesis because synaptogenesis tells us that though the hardware is very important, that is a neuron, it's very, very important. What is more important is the software, which means how do these neurons work? And these neurons work only when they connect with each other. Again, they can transmit their information from one to the other that allows the process of learning. Learning is nothing but synaptogenesis. Learning and synaptogenesis are nothing but neurons coding for the knowledge or the experience or the stimulation or whatever you have received and storing it to go further in storing and coding for further knowledge. This process of learning is possible in the brain only because multiple neurons decide to shake hands and share their information with each other, which is essentially what we are going to do today, this evening, as well as each and every time all of us meet as professionals. And how do we transmit information from one part to the other? That's this myelin sheath and this is deficient at birth.
just like the synapses are deficient at birth, but as the child develops and receives stimulation from the environment, more and more synapses decide to join hands and share information what the eyes have seen, they share that information with what the ears are hearing, they share that with what the tongue is tasting, and they share that with what the hands are touching. And they do it faster and faster because they develop this myelin sheath. And hence, my dear friends, I'm sure you must have seen this a thousand times. It's worth saying it one more time. If you look at the density of synapse formation, in other words, what did we see is a synapse? is a handshake between two neurons who decide to share their knowledge and keep that in mind and going ahead. If you see, a newborn child has sparse synapogenesis. The neurons are all there. The 200 billion neurons at birth are there. But look at how poorly they are networking with each other. Nobody wants to share knowledge with each other. But the moment the child is born, he starts or she starts seeing, hearing, listening, touching, feeling. Look at suddenly how they are spurted to join hands with each other. And look at the density within six months and two years. Now, two crucial points. Between two to four, you would expect that the synaptic density goes adding and becomes more and more dense that there is more and more learning happening, but you will be surprised to see that actually this density goes down. It's called synapse pruning. What it means is what you haven't used in the first two years, the nature feels you don't need it and it starts pruning or cutting it away. So no longer can we say that the learning is most important. Rather, we should say that the learning is most significant in the first two years after birth and of course the nine months of pregnancy and even within that if you really decide to split hair look at the difference between six months and two years it's not so much as much as the difference between newborn and six months or even three months and six months which means the magic is really happening in the nine months of pregnancy and the first year or at the most the first two years after life what does it mean it means that the ability of the child to take in knowledge may not be able to exhibit it, but to store it, to organize it, to compartmentalize it, and to form the basic architecture for all learning in life is laid down and completed in the first thousand days of life, which is the nine months of pregnancy and the two years after birth or the three years maximum after birth. So we must understand that nature has given us a small window. It is crucial for the best development of the child that this window is opened into a wide door and everything that we can put in is put in in the right way at the right speed. So it's not only the quantity, but the quality, the manner, the method, the methodology that we decide to expose children to early childhood development. And this is a critical period of brain development, precisely what I said, that you will see that the neurons and the brain structure is being formed even before birth. Here is birth. This is all activity happening before birth. And like you see, it continues throughout life. Of course, there is a peak here in the first two, three years of life, which is why our work is very important in the first five, six, seven years of life. But things are not as rosy as they look because the challenge to the development is early adversities like poverty, poor health and nutrition, insufficient protection, poor responsive care, no learning opportunities, especially many children in low income and poor countries do not reach their developmental potential. So, garib garib rehega, wala baat hai ki people who do not get all this, their future generations will continue to show poor development. And this is what we must understand because worst health outcomes with poverty are multiplied if there are multiple adversities. And if poverty is added on as an adversity, plus there is poor health and nutrition or insufficient protection or poor responsive care, then it gets worse and worse and worse. And hence, there is a complex interplay of many, many risk factors associated with poverty. And hence, the force multipliers are 40% of children below 18 years, if they are living in extreme poverty with multiple adversity, adversities, there is a huge developmental risk for the entire world in terms of cognition, psychosocial adjustment and health. And now contrast this with the picture I showed you in the earlier slide that all of this is happening in the narrow window 
of the first three years of life. So if you have any access to a political uh, lobby or any kind of lobby or any kind of uh, wealth or any kind of politics or any kind of policy making, if I may say so, whatever you do across the lifespan is less significant and far less important in the narrow window of the first thousand years of life that is ECD because what you do in ECD has a far stronger multiplied impact than what you do, may do for a person when he's 18, 20, 25 years of age. And this is what we must remember every day that the negative effects during this time are absolutely detrimental to the child's development. But the good news is all of this can be modified by the nurturing care, information, knowledge, experience that we have gained and hence, whether it is UNICEF or WHO or many, many, many organizations across the world, including Indian Academy of Pediatrics and now ASEN, are right in pushing forward for this knowledge sharing on nurturing care and forming synapses with each other from different fields, different stakeholders. Because unless we form synapses in our own lives with different stakeholders, whether they are doctors, pediatricians, gynecologists, nurses, school teachers, preschool teachers, educationists, therapists, psychologists, anganwadi workers, asha workers, we will not be able to get the advantage of how our work can prevent early cumulative adversities and the negative effects. And hence, dear friends, a protective home, nurturing home environment is the most important to protect the young child from the negative consequences of early cumulative adversities. So I am going to make my point here that eventually it is the home. It is not the certainly not the hospital. It is certainly not a therapy center and perhaps not even the school as much as a nurturing home environment. And hence, whether we are doctors, therapists, educationists, psychologists or early school teachers, we must all remember that it is not just the young child whom we must target, but his parents whom we have to also understand we have to work with so that whatever we do in our couple of hours or three hours or four hours in school or preschool is maximized at home. This is the first point I wanted to make. Now to make this easier for all of us, we need to compartmentalize this. And hence the nurturing care has been compartmentalized into five domains. First is good health, adequate nutrition, which I'm sure most of us are aware about and I'm going to just touch upon it. But safety and security is an important issue. I don't think you can do justice to it entirely today. We will touch upon it. But the two key issues are responsive caregiving and opportunities for early learning, which we will look at in some detail. Hence, just to say that all of this is evidence-based, you are all free to take pictures or slides or screenshots, whatever you want. These are the books across the year. So there was this book called Care for Child Development, developed by Professor Jean from United States, whom I met in Geneva. And the early childhood years by UNICEF and so many books that I would request all of you to have seen along with this wonderful book that we release here today. The other important resource I'm trying to draw is very often we try to re, you know, reinvent the wheel and redo the whole things. There is this humble, the mother and child protection card or the MCP card that is given in each and every all government dispensary to every child, a newborn child. Even if you use that, we don't need to use some expensive tools or apps or whatever. This has it all and just taking advantage of this. So what we did at IAP when we recognized the role that we did, we came up with this program called Nurturing Care or IAP Nurture Care for Childhood Development. We came up with this concept of 11 well child visits across the first 36 months and what the medical team can do by service delivery, what parents can do at home. So this was how we planned a Explain to the doctor, pediatrician, what the offer what will the doctor ask, what will the doctor ask, what will the doctor say. And in this manner, there are modules that we can share with you from IAP. Every example at nine months, the sixth well child visit, what will the history, where do you stay, what is happening, how many is your child being fed, the height, weight, all of that can be done by the staff. Critical questions and evaluations pediatricians. And then using the MCP card, we can ask the parent whether the child's development and growth are on the right track, 
If not, if they fall under this red zone that is shown here, if it is green, it's all fine. Then what to do? So the blue zone includes activities for the child at the stage where he is. For example, at nine months, what do you do to promote the child? If he's in the green zone, he's come fine till nine months. Now you need to do this to take the child ahead. But unfortunately, if you find any of the features in the zone, then you need to refer the child immediately to a developmental pediatrician. And this is what we did in Indian Academy of Pediatrics. We released this on 14th November 2021, just in the middle of a region online. But after that, then we launched training of trainers because we had to train 10 across the length and breadth of the country. And we trained. And then there was a day long workshop for each and every pediatrician country. There was pre and post testing. I was the national. To enable this happening across every Samir, your voice is dropping in between. Okay, is it better now? Yeah, I mean, in, it goes faint in between, so sometimes yeah, we miss. Is, yeah, point it out to me, please, when that happens, and I'll try and uh, switch on to. So basically, each uh, workshop had four pediatricians who were the trainers who had to go up there. It had all to be organized, the tickets the stay, the venue, and 40 pediatricians were invited for each of the trainings. And this happened, as Madam said, right in the middle of COVID. So it was an absolutely difficult feat to do. But fortunately, we were able to do this. And this is how we try to encourage each and every one of our members by making themselves proud to be an ECD champion. And across all the five zones of the country, we did 40 workshops each. And that is how we were able to take this work across to the whole country. Now, going ahead, if you have to look at the first part, that is the health or the overall part of it as well, we know that it is the SDG, Sustainable Developmental Goals, that have mandated this work. And we have to ensure that everybody has access to quality early childhood development care and pre-primary education. India is a signatory to it. So the proportion of children under five years of age who are developmentally on track in health, learning, and psychosexual well-being have to be monitored. ECD is an supposed to be an integrated concept across various domains where physical growth as well as developmental domains are involved and multiple sectors and stakeholders, all of us, not just the child, but also the community and the government, everybody is involved. There are various definitions of how early is early. WHO says eight years. IAP decided to do the first three years, but all of that is very important because this is a neurological, neurobiological concept that the brain development is absolutely the maximally rapid in the first four to five years of age. By the time you're five years of age, your brain development is 90% completed in terms of the synapses. <clears throat> so very little is left to be gained. But more than that, if there has been a damage, there is very little time to reverse that damage. And hence, ECD is on one level a promotive as well as on the other, an interventional and a curative platform for children. We know that various factors influence development and 250 million children, 43% of the world's children under five will not reach their expected potential. All of this is this wonderful book that all of you are going to get. And here is a composite index across the world. What we need to understand is every sector and stakeholder are all acquired. And here you see education being a very important role. And this is what are those enabling environments that we need to provide. So the first enabling environment is a caregiver's capacities that needs to be empowered. And then the empowered communities, including the schools, then the early and the early childhood education, supportive services like ours, then the enabling policies. So the, though this is a life course approach, if we work in the first three years, we actually end up impacting the entire life course approach. The five guiding principles being right to survive and thrive, no, leave no child behind, whole of society, whole of government, but the most important part is family-centered care. So we will begin with health. I'm just going to touch a little bit of this just to make you aware that health is a very important component of the child's development. It has to be promotive, as I mentioned, preventive, curative, also rehabilitative and palliative. And all of this have a different time and a different target. Universal, curative, promotive, preventive health services are for all children. But those who are at high risk need special rehabilitative uh, 
approach that we will be able to do that. For example, the children at highest risk for malnutrition need to be looked at, but the rehabilitative is maximally for those who are indicated who already have special needs, who need specialized support. The point that I'm showing this slide is good health is attainable via caregivers. So it is a caregivers who need to be coached by all of us because seeking appropriate curative health, aware of children's physical development, emotional status, affectionate and appropriate responses to the child's daily needs. All of this needs to be practiced by the parents. And here is this concept of growth monitoring because 40% of Indian children are stunted, 21% have wasting, 7.5% have severe wasting. So I'm sure you are all aware about these road to health cards. They are again available on the MCP card, which will allow the parents and the mother or the ASHA worker or the Anganwadi worker or the school teacher or the doctor to track whether the child's growth is on the right track or not. Just for our information, we need to start at birth for external birth defects. Hearing screening needs to be a very important part of it. Never miss out on the possibility of a visual problem in your child. Orodental hygiene is very important because it eventually affects the nutrition of the child. Personal hygiene and very important physical activity, sleep hygiene and screen time are three things which have gone for a toss especially in this digital era. At the same time, remembering that parents are under a high stress and that can actually worsen the risk for the child is very important. So this is what we had to talk about health. Going ahead to nutrition, I'm sure all of you are very, very knowledgeable about it. And we know that not just macronutrients, not just proteins and fats and carbohydrates, but the micronutrients, whether it is zinc or whether it is Magnesium or manganese or iron, all of that is extremely important. Breastfeeding, I'm sure all of us will keep promoting, but complementary feeding, the word now is no longer weaning, but complementary feeding beyond six months, we need to start at six months. If we do not start by six months, we actually have evidence that the growth falters. So please look at this picture here. By the time the child is six months, you need to introduce the top feeds in the right way and shift on by the time the child is one to two years to entire family pot. Micronutrients and vitamins, like I said, are far more important in reaching the eventual growth dimensions and even more in reaching the absolute neurological, neurodevelopmental outcomes for children. So I see, uh, IYC, that is infant and young child feeding indicators in the NHFS survey of 2016, not very uh, happy. I mean, look at this data, for example, Breastfed children aged 6 to 23 months, how many received adequate diet? Only 8.7. How many non-breastfed children receiving adequate diet? Only 14.3. Total children receiving adequate diet? 10%. Can you believe this? And this is where all of us need to be aware that eventually it is the nutrition and the health that impacts the child's development the most. These are all charts you can get everywhere. And this is one of the favorite charts. I see it put up fortunately in every preschool, every area, everywhere else about how the food groups are very important. What is very important is the concept of responsive feeding. Half the children I see come for, mera bachcha khana hi nahi khata hai. Wo mangta hi nahi hai. Arre, mangta nahi, aap mangne dete hi nahi ho usko. Ek ghanta nahi hoa to aapka alarm bachta hai, uske piche bhaagte ho. You run after the child, hold the child and force feed the child. You are actually making the child think that eating is a stressful assault process. And why would the child, anybody be happy to get assaulted? So the whole idea about convincing parents about, you know, be patient, let the child understand what is hunger and ask for food. Let the child understand what is satiety and refuse food. All of this is extremely important and both should enjoy this as parents as well as the child. If you look at the other indicators of the burden that we are looking at, just Lancet, as we mentioned, 250 million to not reach the developmental potential. And again, when we talk about development of the child, the brain development and developmental uh, 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 aspects of the developmental milestones of the child, many of the developmental faltering is due to modifiable causes and that can get addressed. So timely identification of the developmental delay is associated with better outcomes and reduced disability and handicap. Why? Because of neuroplasticity, which is a very, very important term for every teacher to understand or every early childhood educator, every childhood development worker to understand that formation of new synapses or activation of latent circuits can be uh, improved by immediate early intervention. And this is very important because before stimulation, if you see 
This is the synaptogenesis. Two weeks after stimulation, the synaptogenesis gets better. And two months after that, look at the density. So there is evidence that if you do the right intervention, the children, even those who have a developmental delay, can actually catch up. And here we have said the mother and child protection card has a developmental component. Again, please feel free to take a photograph. Color-coded zones for early identification. It has a green zone for developmental milestones. If your child shows this at that particular age, you are in the green belt, you are safe. And then the blue zone shows what you could do for your child who is safe at that age to go on to the next developmental stage. But if the child shows any danger signs that fall into the red zone, then you need to immediately push the child up for reference. There again, you see the green zone here, what most babies do at that particular age. What are the parenting tips for parents to do at that age? But what has to be worried immediately, lacks health control, cannot sit up even with help. These are the things. So what I'm trying to say is many of us debate, oh, should we have American guidelines? Do we not have Indian guidelines? Do we have a specific developmental chart? It doesn't matter. Just take this government mother and child protection card. It has all of this in a very, very useful, effective manner. We come now to responsive care, and this perhaps is the most important part of what we should know, understanding responsive caregiving. It's not necessarily parenting. And how do we explain the concept of positive parenting to parents? And how do we understand the danger of poor sleep hygiene screen time? So if you see what is responsive caregiving, you basically, what you do is a response to what the child is doing, not a reaction. What is the difference? Perhaps the difference is you react in a reflex, but you respond by thinking, by observing what the child is trying to do, by recognizing what perhaps the child wants to convey to you, and then thinking about what should be your appropriate response, rather than reacting in a flash. So you look at the needs and cues, the movements of even a small baby, the emotions, hunger and satiety, the verbal, non-verbal communication. And hence, effective caregivers are those who take a pause to do this ORA, observe, recognize, and the appropriate response. So correctly interpret what their child wants and need, And their response is not just a, a good response, but it is consistent and appropriate because this will develop consistent, appropriate networks in the brain. And this promotes social engagement, cognitive development, emotional regulation. I, you know, I cannot tell you how important the message that we are talking about right now is because how the parents respond to the child determines the child's intellectual, social, and emotional regulation throughout life. These are what we call typical in tennis. You have the serve and return reactions. Basically, this is what our dadima always told us. Every dadima can say that basically notice what the child is do doing. Draw the child's attention towards yourself. Reply or return the serve by supporting and encouraging. Give it a name. Take turns. Again, wait for the child to respond. So build up one after the other, one after the other, continue to be engaged with each other. And hence, you need to do this in several interactions throughout the day. If parents don't have time, you need to tell them that they need to have somebody else to do it. It has to be a human being who can do interaction. It's not the TV or the digital media or even the book if the parent is not there. Please let's remember that. Implications are create secure emotional bonds and attachment helps have handy emotional regulation, adjust to situations and resilience, which is exactly what we needed in COVID and every day thereafter, builds a foundation of trust, early social relationships, early learning and communication. And this will be communicated by the child who grows up to be an adult and a parent to his child. Extremely important concept for all of us to know. We know about attachment where the child attaches to the caregiver, but attunement is a parent's ability to perceive, interpret, and respond appropriately to the child's needs. So this helps the child recognize their own emotions and feelings and regulate them. Secure attachment has various features. I'm sure all of you know it. You can see the happy look on both the mother and the child's face. But the mother is able to recognize when the child looks uneasy and the child looks uneasy when the parent withdraws and looks really excited on the appearance. How does the mother comfort or relax the child? How does the child get comforted or relaxed? All of these are signs which are very important. And all of us know about these senses. I'll touch upon it in my next presentation next time. But the effect of toxic stress cannot be undermined because it actually disrupts brain anatomy, the levels of neurotransmitters. In the long term, epigenetic modification actually drives a cognitive impairment as adults. 
So this has to be very important. Positive parenting, rather than just being a set of rules, it has to be a to and fro, safe, secure, and loving environment, positive learning environment. All this need to be explained to the parent. And this is where I'm sure all of us are aware that children are not good or bad, only their behaviors are good or bad. So creating a safe environment, establishing a routine is the most important thing I would say, a schedule for the child. Planning the planning ahead that day after, if you have to go and visit a relative who's unwell, how will I deal with my child? Am I going to take her with me? If so, what will I carry along the way? All these things are very important. Giving the child a feeling of, of autonomy, building a positive relationships, but establishing limits and rules and values, consequences of unacceptable behavior, positively reinforcing acceptable behavior, and very important, not giving in to the child's tantrums. So again, how do you manage tantrums? I don't think there's a talk for today, but I'm sure all of us are aware and can do about this in detail some other time. But what's also important is the father's uh, participation in, in nurturing care. And what has been seen that if the father is involved, the overall impact on the child's early development is far more significantly recognized. So key message again, as we said, parents of toddlers should be asked about sleep hygiene, screen time, and concerns about daily activities at home far more than we're doing right now. Going ahead to the early learning opportunities as we see here. Yeah, just, uh, I'm just going to skip through this again. So when we look at early learning, what exactly is learning? On one hand, I, we saw that picture of synapses, shaking hands, agreeing to work with each other, transferring knowledge for each other to acquire more knowledge. Similarly, this is seen in daily life by the process of acquiring new understanding, knowledge, behaviors, skills, values, attitudes, and preferences through study experiences or being taught, basically by being exposed to lots of things happening around the child which is nothing but early stimulation or appropriate stimulation and being put in a holistic developmental environment because this involves cognitive, language, social, emotional and physical skills. And parents are the earliest teachers who provide meaningful experiences at home. And we must not forget this. No doctor, therapist or teacher can ever imagine that they can replace parents, however highly educated and knowledgeable we may be, because eventually it is a parent or the child responds to the most and is the parent the most. And learning, we must understand, is promoted to play, communication and reading. But if you ask me as a developmental pediatrician of my 21 years, the most important part of learning is through human engagement and social interaction. So if you have a child who's sitting in a corner and turning pages, a three-year-old child, just turning pages and if some child comes to the house to play, the child doesn't look up, the mother comes in the house or leaves the house, the child doesn't pay attention, but only keeps turning the pages. I wouldn't say he's learning a great deal by looking at the book. I would say I have to rule out autism. So let's please understand that it is eventually the human engagement that is learning. It's not the toy that creates, gives play, or it's not the mobile phone that leads to communication. It is not the book that leads to reading. It is the human engagement with toys and the child, with books and the child, with other activities and the child, that actually helps the child learn. So this is something which we will take up again in my next session. Whereas many parents are unaware of the even the importance of play, they just think that feeding the child, taking care of the child's toilet needs, clothing the child, this is a very important aspect that we need to do. And some of them may not have the time and the ability for it. They may have illness, they may be busy with work, they may have had no exposure in the past. And hence today the thought is, oh, buy an expensive phone, or a mobile phone for your child or a tablet for your child and the child will watch that and become the next Einstein. Again, we will take uh, this on as actually how this is worsening the developmental disorders of children in our next talk. Going ahead, what we need to understand is of course, play should be voluntary. The child should be enjoying it. It should be purposeful and spontaneous. Children learn through play with parents, then family members. I'm adding a very big important four letter word here, then family members and a very, very capital T-H-E-N peers, then peers. Because I have many children who come to me, my child is not interacting with me, my not interacting with the family members, keeps looking at the wall, keeps turning pages. Somebody said, put him in a school and he will do all right. Let's forget that part because that child is obviously autistic, he's not going to do better in the school with peers. But what is the normal part? 
the normal part is that if the child develops the capacity to engage and play with parents, then the family members are not exactly like the parents, but not too different also. They're a little different, but if you can have the capacity to handle parents, then the child can learn the little extra incremental capacity with family members. And only if he's expert with the Chachi, Masi, Pishima, Masima, Bua, Fupi, Khala, Dadijan, only then picking this up, developing his capacities with them, will the child be able to connect with the school teacher and then with the peers. So instead of just focusing on toys or the curriculum, we have to also focus on what is the parents and the family's role in all of this. So we know about the social emotional cognitive part and there again social interaction with peers. So hence learning to share, take turns and negotiate relationships without conflict can not be taught by Dr. Dalvai or the anybody else who may claim that they are development pediatricians or OTs or psychologists or physiotherapists or occupational therapists or speech therapists, neither by the parents, neither by the school teachers. It can only be taught by Samaj and family and Chachi, Masi, Bua, Mami, Kaki, everybody else. And enough time needs to be spent with them for the child to go through this stage before the child enters a play group or a play school. And this I cannot overemphasize. I mean, I can go on for the next half an hour on this, but in uh, uh, interest of reason, I will not do that, but I will definitely take this pause to make a very strong plea for this. So play with parents, build strong bonds and help in sharing of problems later with others. And that is why we need to be aware about how children are spending time with parents and their relatives. That's where they reduce stress and enjoy themselves. How do you select the correct toy game and play activities? It is not that that cannot be answered by Hamleys, which has been bought by an Indian magnate who has bought England, the world's oldest toy company, knowing now that Indians have a lot of money to spend on their child, but very little time to spend with their child. So they will compensate their guilt by buying costly toys that Hamley can sell and somebody is laughing their way to the bank. The only answer to this Selecting the correct toy game and play activities, there are two parts of this answer. One is the correct toy game and play activities, one which can be done with other human beings and which has more of a component of the other human beings than the toy or the book or the game per se. And second is it has to be at the developmental level at which the child is. And depending on the level of the child's development, this I'm sure all of you know, at what stage will you do what kind of a gross motor game or a fine motor or a receptive language etc and this is what is very important should be understood and the same holds true for communication communication should be appropriate for the level of understanding of the child if the child is understanding simple commands come here sit down take this do this only then should you go on to a little more complex command take this and give it to mommy bring that and keep it here hold this and keep it there these are two-step commands. You cannot do that unless one-step commands are mastered. Now, sometimes the child comes to school, there is a curriculum. Everybody has the same thing. Children, remove, open your school bag, take out your books and keep it on the table. For example, I'm sure none of you do that. But if the child has not reached that level of understanding, he or she will not be able to do that. So this applies to the way also in which the infant, toddler or young child is read to. For example, nobody would want to read Shakespeare to a toddler. At least I would not recommend it. So first year, all this, I'm sure it may not be something that you are unaware about, but my point is understand it, break it up. What should be done in the zero to six months, depending on what the child likes. And if you ask me, this is what it is. This is what is most important. My life's learning is this. How do you hold the child's attention by making funny faces? Because when you make funny faces, your child is looking at you. But when you buy these very wonderful rattles, rattles, etc., etc., the child is not looking at you. Building a tower is not the most important skill or development a child needs. Looking at the mother, smiling with the mother, enjoying with the mother, with, with the mother is the operating word here. Child goes grows older, 7 to 12 months. Now he starts moving, rolling over. So appropriate kind of games and toys can be brought in here. For example, simple things like peekaboo is extremely important here. What I find is I'm going to be a little nasty about this is building towers and knocking downs, place rings on rings that I cannot tell you how overrated these things are. I don't 
care if my child can bloody build a sorry for that build a tower or not i don't care for this what i care is not even for this i want a child turning around and looking at the mama and let this thing in be in between the mama and the child so at least the child's half the vision involves the mother and not this way where there is no mother here at all and even if she is here she is behind the child i see zero value in the child recognizing which ring to put up here if he doesn't have a good eye contact or engagement or interaction with the mother so well that's my personal take people are free to disagree with that second year again then we start with the verbal comprehension and the verbal thing a very important concept of pit and play and the copycat games the children come up and of course rough and tumble play all toddlers enjoy running around and rolling over and things like that 25 to 36 months i'm sure now is a domain where all of you are better than far better than me at understanding what to do with the kids and i shall not tell you what to do about it but what i'm going to definitely say is if what the child needs to do at 6 months is not ready is not doing by the time the child comes to you do not think you can start doing what needs to be done at 35 months because your curriculum tells you to the curriculum can be go you know wherever but what is very important is this child in front of you needs to have achieved this then this then this and this and then your curriculum and can come in if the child has developed enough to receive your curriculum if the child is way behind however great the curriculum may be it is harmful to the child forget about not being beneficial it is harmful and hence what we tell parents is look into your baby's eyes smile and laugh with your child more important than talking too much because talk ke liye to mobile phone hai na alexa hai uh wow youtube hai no smile and laugh with your child extremely important and show and talk as a child grows older it's not buying those toys which are extremely difficult uh, expensive or those you know the latest uh, smartphone this is far more important if you want your child to be a normal human being and not a nor and not a geek so rather than showing the digital gadgets simple things khane ka plate kitna rakhte hain towel leke nahane ke liye jaane ka hai how do you sit down for your meal by bringing your food how do you finish a meal by taking the plates back how do you what do you do after you wake up you even help your mother to even fold the the mattress and keep the whatever can be done physically by the child of course you are not going to ask the child to lift a 10 kilo bucket but whatever the child can do at home about normal human living is far more important than shape sorting color mapping solving puzzles teaching rhymes no it's basically about understanding how humans live live and if all of this is achieved all of this is in place the human engagement the human connect is in place by all means begin the book but if the child's eye contact with you the human engagement with you is not very strong it may be a little bit of a risk to get the child involved with this so it is always reading with a parent that is very important just to put up a picture about a handbook that we brought out in the indian academy of pediatrics and that uh, that time i'll be happy to send you a copy with the mem a copy of this but simple concepts explained in the very simple words for all of you you can look at that and finally safety and security so the basic difference safety is a state in which one is protected from hazards caused by natural forces whereas security is an issue in which one is protected from hazards that result from human actions or behavior intended to cause harm so safety is a child who's left uh, unprotected and rolls down the stairs because there was nothing no barrier there and in the security is when somebody comes in and does something negative or harmful to the child all of these things are self understood my only point of showing is make it a point to include it when you speak to the parents you speak to your you know the younger cousins who have a kid now and things like that because so many children actually die from all these highly prevented preventable issues using a car seat for example how many indian children are actually put in a car seat all these things are very important about emotional abuse i will not go into the detail of that but look at the numbers and hence one of the most significant pillars of nurturing care is do not forget safety and security and i'm sure all of you can just pick up the i have already posted these pictures in your uh in the class schools especially the area where parents come in or if wherever you have a pta or a parental interaction please make sure that you draw their attention to these issues you know this entire concept of having these flat buckets by flat side buckets earlier we used to have those you know typical tin ka ya kya tha i don't know but those metallic 
or buckets which were triangular conical. And the whole idea was that when you fill up that bucket, the conical bucket, in case the child were to fall into it, the bucket topples because it is conical. The moment the child falls in it, it topples. Unfortunately, now there is this fashion of these tubs and these buckets which are like tubs. There is a child falls, the bucket will not topple over saving the child. So all these things and suffocation, the number of amount of plastic we have, okay, plastic causing global warming is of course extremely important. But look at what is happening here to the child choking. So I'm going to take a little break here and ask you, are you all feeling overwhelmed because of what I'm doing to you? So I'm just going to now make it a, come to the conclusion. One of my favorite, uh, this is the best book on psychology that you can ever read rather than reading some theoretical volumes. Calvin and Hobbes, if you can find even one person you really like, you are lucky. The question we have to keep asking ourselves, can we be that one person? Because if we wish to do something, we will always be able to find something to do. So the whole concept is about getting the village to live together and thrive together. And very important concept of ECD is this, that if we change the beginning of the story, we change the whole story. That is where all of us, all of you, the wonderful work you do, the early childhood education that you are looking at is extremely, extremely important because you can change the whole story. Just going to put a screen here for some of you who may want to take a screenshot and there are some references and articles that I've written. I'll put it in the chat box also. You can go through them if you like. And finally, thanks a lot. I, mean, I hope I have not taken too much of your time. And thanks a lot for whatever I could share is largely because of my work with Indian Academy of Pediatrics, but more so with New Horizons Child Development Center, which Rinda Ma'am mentioned in the beginning, since 2003, we've been working here, a team of 120 people now across six centers. And what is most important, there are children outside Bombay, so we have an online support system for children and parents. So thank you once again for being very, very patient and kind. And this is the first in a series of two uh, talks, if I may say so, that I have been given. And next time, this was about all children and regular development. So next time, I'm sure we'll try and focus more on neurodevelopmental disorder. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dalwail. The way you have presented your articulation, the illustrations that you used, the metaphors that you used has made it all feel so very different. The words that you use, the synapses, handshaking with each other, and especially the aspect about human interaction, we all know it. But I think with the way your visuals brought out, the mother sitting behind the child, because it's quite true that a lot of us and particularly, you know, the better off families uh, do focus too much on developing the child's cognitive skills. Correct. And, you know, I mean, uh, I remember I, I just have to invoke my own mentor, Dr. Ananda Lakshmi, whom many of you would know. And I remember that as young students, she would always caution us that don't be so cognitive in your thinking. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I really couldn't understand what is she saying because I thought I have to think with my brain and what else can I be except be cognitive in my thinking. But as I grow and as I, you know, get feedback from children, one really feels that what they remember is the human interaction that you had or did not have. And uh, that is the lasting images uh, in their mind. So this is absolutely, absolutely so very uh, crucial that you have pointed out. And uh, some of the information and the way that you have put it is absolutely new. I had no idea about the conical steel buckets, which you are saying. Yes, I remember that in my childhood. But the purpose or whatever, yes, it's very, very effectively brought out by you. And it's something, it's a pointer that uh, certainly we need to be very careful about. And as I wait uh, for the questions, I will ask you a few of my own and then maybe the people who are uh, present in the Zoom call itself may like to open, uh, unmute themselves and ask. And if there are questions on the Facebook, I'll be reading those out. You mentioned about the screen time, Dr. Dalvai, and I was wondering that is there an absolutely an age when it is a no, a absolutely strict no, before which uh, there should be no time, no, uh, no, no, no amount of screen time at all. Is there some such age before which we just should not begin? Uh, I'll answer that in two parts. One is the uh, guidelines part. Uh, one part is the recommendations. So the American Academy of Pediatrics and now the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. So please look this up. Parental guidelines of 
the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. It's available free download from the internet. Indian Academy of Pediatrics Parental Guidelines. They are freely available for Indian parents, this is of course. So they are customized for Indian situation other than rather than the United States or whatever it is. Okay. So these guidelines you can download. So all these guidelines say that below two years, zero screen time, except for live video chats with family members or relatives because the grandparents unfortunately in today's time everybody stays apart and covid so you couldn't travel maybe the father was stuck up in some other country and the child was here and for long periods of time my point is they are going so this is clear to two years no screen time from two years to five years one hour at the most but content has to be very importantly modified and after five years then it is with parental regulation blah 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 Guidelines you can look up. My point of view is why is screen time an addiction? I'm not talking about how it is bad for the brain that we have understood or we can talk separately. Screen is bad and there is a video again if you go to YouTube and uh, you put my name and screen time and narcotics. You, you pop, type these words screen time and narcotics. Eight, six years back I said this in a meeting somewhere that screen mobiles are worse than narcotics or screens are worse than narcotics. Why? Because nobody buys narcotics for their children. But everybody wants to take a loan on the EMI and buy the latest smartphone for their child thinking ke ke bhale ke liye. So the danger is in what parents think by far extravagantly overestimating the importance of benefit of screen time. The second is the Screen is so is so interactive in a pattern, is so patterned, I may say, rather than interactive, that you get glued onto it because it always does what you say. Who doesn't like when people follow what you say? You can take the screen, go wherever you want, you can surf what you want, you can look at, play whatever game you want. This is the terrific dopamine surge. If you meet somebody who does whatever you say, you will fall in love with that person. No two things about it. The best way to get somebody to fall in love with you is to do whatever they want. So this is the problem with the child gets the device in his hand and he understands ki boss, mere mein ka sar sakta then it is very difficult to get the child not to be addicted. Yeah. So do not give the device in your child's hand as far as you can. Even when you have to give it, keep the controls with you. So even if you have a five-year-old child, six-year-old child, seven-year-old child, the point is not how much TV he or she watches. The point is, do you have a set of rules or a schedule? That you TV a day, our TV is only one hour. Yes, but when you see it, that is a point. Why? Because it comes from what time to what time. So if the child is able to take, the, you give the device, say, in the schedule, my child can watch TV from three to four. If you can give the TV at 3, you do give the TV at 3 if you have committed. But if you say at quarter to 4, that beta bhi 15 minute mein band karna hai. You have to give a reminder. That's normal parenting. Again, 5 minutes before. Abhi 5 minute hai baki hai. That's normal. All of us like reminders. Okay, Dr. Dalwai, abhi wind up. Both ho hai. So wind up. And then, now it's 4, we are shutting it off. This is a crucial one. If the child will cry, no child will say, okay, mama, you are right. That again is dangerous. Is the name of two minutes, two minutes? No. Okay, TKO, you are always like this. He may crib, make a face, she may, you know, make a face at you. But gives up, then starts doing what was supposed to be done from 4 p.m. And after some time, it's forgotten. This is absolutely okay. But if the child who at quarter to four doesn't listen only to what you are saying, that time is going At four, hey, go, go away. And at 4, if you try to take it at 10 minutes or 10 minutes more, from 10 minutes to 10 minutes more, 5 minutes more, it's 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and even after that, if you take the screen away, the child shouts, screams, throws her tantrums, brings the house down, shouts so that the neighbors think you are treating, ill-treating her, so that neighbors will keep running in and they will give you the mobile back and does all these kinds of manipulations to get the mobile back, that is addiction. Right. The moment you find your child going there, stop entirely. That is what you need to do. So that's what I meant by the screen part. Yeah. I hope that answer.
Yeah, certainly. There's another question by Swati and she's asking that because of also single child families and also because children outdoor playing has reduced and what uh, is the detrimental effect of this lack of social interaction on development and I would just add to it that is it a city phenomena only because the, with your you know so much of your work with the um, nurturing care framework and the training of uh, uh, pediatricians across the country do you think because often we say this is a very city type of a phenomena so I, I come from a place called Chiplu okay forget the pediatricians I'll tell you my experience in Chiplu during Ramzan people get into a car and drive down to Bombay for iftar yeah. uh, what, what to call this phenomena I don't understand so this is not left to a urban social, urban rural divide at all. It is affluenza. Everybody has become affluent. And the fact that they feel doing all these things are better for their children than otherwise. Yeah. All 15 year olds in Kokan are driving two wheelers. The father is working abroad somewhere, making do what was all the effort he's taking, staying away from his family, sending money instead of whatever they need to do. So all of these are basically a regular phenomenon everywhere. Everybody has a lot of disposable income and is able to do it. Yeah. Hence, it is basically our decision what we are doing. If there is no time for play, who has done the child's or developed the child's lifestyle in a way that there is no time? When we tell the schools, you are to blame, you are starting computers at such a young age, iPad, I mean, I... Tablet kyo dere ho ko. You are wrong. They tell me, Dr. Dalwai, come here. These, if I stop this, 50% of the parents will come and threaten me tomorrow. We don't want to come to your backward school. A down market school. Bacho ko tablets nahi sikhate ho. Computer nahi sikhate ho. Kaun se bacho ko? Pre-primary ke bacho ko. How will I run my school? At the end of the day, I have a business. I have to make business means I have to make money to pay my cost, right? I have some cost. Government schools have also started doing that. Why? Because parents are demanding this. Yes. Parents are not bothered if there is no playground. Why are you allowing no playgrounds? Why are we not shouting about it? Other issues we are very hyper about everything. Why are we not? So my point is, it is the worst thing that has happened to children is that what she said, playing together is reduced drastically outdoor with and even indoor. Yes, you are right. Indoor with single kids and reduced and reduced social intervention. What detrimental effects does this have? Two hours, I will talk about it next time. Two hours, only about this. I have now come up and I will share that with you in the chat box if you don't want to come back next time. I've come up with a theory which is called the theory of human engagement for autism. Mm -hmm. The theory of human engagement for autism and opposed to what United States, American CDC, American guidelines, British guidelines, Indian guidelines, you know, Australian guidelines are saying, I'm saying autism is basically caused because there is an innate deficiency in the child to engage with other human beings. But today the world wants that to happen. The child doesn't get human engagement, but the child gets too many objects. So the gene which was there for thousands of years, where there were some people who are genetically not... No option. Chachi thi, masi thi, somebody will come and do this to the child, somebody will be there, he had no option. So though he lacked the genes, he still got that from the environment. The environment pulled him towards human engagement. Today, the environment is making sure that is pushed into object involvement and not towards human engagement. Because parents feel better to give him a screen. Parents feel, I have to go to office. There's nobody in the house. There's no other children to meet with. And we do not prioritize going to Chachi, Masi, Mami at all. Every parent today in a city, maybe not so much in a village yet, wants to have the child go to school before he's born and then go to this class and that class and that class. There are some areas in Bombay, which I will not name, which are only responsible for this. They want that in the it's the mothers, the, the fathers, the circuit. Aapka bacha ye kar bala aapki kamis mere kamis se safed kaise. Aapka bacha eight activities kar raha hai, mera bacha chhe kaise karega. Usko eight nine karna hai. Then there is a car kept for it. There is a driver kept for it. One of the parents want. This is what we are doing willingly. How can we blame anybody except ourselves? 
Yeah. And this is why we need to make society understand that this is making our children abnormal. Because if you do not know how to behave with people, you will lose the advantage that Indians have. And today, most of the Fortune 50 companies have Indian CEOs, not because we are technologically smarter than American kids or European kids, but we are socially smarter than all of them. We know how to handle an African guy. We know how to handle an American guy. We know how to handle a lady from Australia. We know how to handle a Japanese gentleman. Because in India, we have dealt with different people all the time. And we've had so much of that, that we became experts at social interaction. This, if we are taking away, we are cutting down our own advantage. Sure. And after a few years, we'll have our children who are all on the geeks, who are very good at designing things, but have no idea of how to deal with friends, have no friends. And hence, if there is something going wrong, they don't know how to be resilient or how to deal with it. And you will find an increasing amount of suicides happening. And I'm talking suicide at the tip of the iceberg, but the mental illness component, mental health component is going to boom. Is going to boom because of this. Right. Uh, very well said, Dr. Dalvai. And I think if you are saying that people may not come to your next uh, uh, seminar. I think they'll at right. least twice the number of participants given the beautiful way you are explaining things to us. And Rekha Menon in chat has articulated what I was struggling to articulate. She has put it very beautifully that, you know, we talk of parent counseling and making parents understand, but much of this remains voluntary. Can we develop a government program where parents have to compulsorily? Because, you know, one point is this thing about emotional abuse, which you spoke. Sometimes, despite the best of intentions, we do not realize that our words are causing emotional abuse. And you realize it only. I do not have an intention, but at least. <laughs> Oh, that was yours. Uh, yeah, so, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, you know, is there, a, is there a possibility of a government program compulsorily on uh, counseling or training you for parenthood type of a thing? Instead of leaving it voluntary for somebody to join with an NGO and understand, is it there in, elsewhere in the world uh, or anything, any, or any, any global, in any other global context if you are aware? No, for two reasons. No, for two reasons. One is, the government may not prioritize child health and child education in a particular country. Two, if you you are against a multi-billion dollar industry, so it's going to be very difficult because the screens related industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Also, like I said, this is going to lead to another new multi-billion dollar industry coming up, mental health care. If you screen, if you just Google mental health care or psychological support in my in where near where I stay, you will find unlimited this thing. Or if they were truly uh, trained psychologists, I would be happy. You will find far more spurious mental health uh, so-called th uh, therapies and uh, drugs and medicines and otherwise. So there is a huge reason why the government will not do it. I would say that I wish the government would do it, but they would not. Rather, it is left to stakeholders like you and me to really see the bad effect of this, to keep counseling and coaching parents. Right. Because at one point of time, nations used to think governments are not aware of the importance of investing in early childhood development. But I think now that is a, something concerned which has been well taken care of. And I think the point of the, the financial points that you are bringing up are perhaps things which are causing uh, us still not to go the way in which we ought to be going. And so government what will do? Arrest to not kar sakti na father ko ki mobile la ke kyu diya bache ko. Arrest to not kar sakti na. There will be a UN cry on that as well. Whichever government it is. But what I think the government certainly can do or the NGOs can do or IAP can do or ASL can do is to keep creating this awareness <coughs> in terms of... So, IAP has just last week launched a program called IAP Ki Baat Community Ke Saath. How do we take medical information to the layman in their language? So, what we need to do is convert this into language. So, on one hand, of course, there's this amazing book that you showed me. But this is for professionals. If you want a rural mother, a, a semi-educated mother, or a highly educated mother, all to read this, then we need to do this. If you open Instagram, you will see all these influencers. 
Oh, do this if you have a relationship problem. Oh, do this with your child. Two lakh views, four lakh views. Who knows what they are? Uh, their uh, you know their qualification is. Right. So we can't stop them. But we need to put up say on a side. We need to have an Instagram channel where you are posting these reels relentlessly. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Dalvi, one of uh, the persons who's joined us today in the Zoom call is a mentor uh, for most of us. She is uh, Professor Adar Sharma. And I think she wants to open her uh, iPhone, uh, you know, her speaker and talk directly with you. So, ma'am, uh, Dr. Adar Sharma, ma'am, may I request you to unmute yourself and engage with Dr. Dalvai? Ma'am? My video, my video is stopped, Rekha. I let me... Ma'am, your voice is loud and clear. Please come in. Okay. I just wanted to really... I was delighted when Dr. Sab said the use of the mother and child card. Now, if we recall, when I was at Nipset, we prepared with Patricia Angel all those messages and inducted it into the growth monitoring chart. Unfortunately, when you see it at the ground, it's not being used at all. The children, are they come, they are weighed, they are sent away by a &M. And neither the Anganwadi workers nor the parents are aware of it. I think this is one of the things which we can potentially use for raising awareness of parents, particularly in the areas, rural areas, and all the beneficiaries of ICDS. It would be a great thing. I think we need to really promote it. And I was so happy that you said, if you use that, that's enough, which is true. Because they have used it according to the age continuum. First three months, three to six months. Six, and the messages are so appropriate. Messages are so simple. So I'm very grateful that you are recommending it and endorsing it. And I hope it really sees some light in terms of raising awareness of people. Because it's I feel very sad because we participated in the field testing we participated in its finalization, its printing, its translation into all states. But when you see, it's not being used. So I think we should make take make some effort in using that. That was very good as a point. Thank Dr. you. Any, any particular observation you have about why it does not get used in the way it ought to be? Uh, Rekha, I think by and large, I think the whole implementation of the growth monitoring chart gets limited to even the growth monitoring and not really training the parents into it. And secondly, there is no joint contribution of the Anganwari worker and the a and or even ASHA to realize that these messages at the back, which are half the parents may be illiterate, they may not be even saying. So I think it should be uh, backed up with a workshop kind of a thing along with the growth monitoring and it should become mandatory that at that time sometimes re someone really comes and elaborates and repeats every time those messages. This is my view. I don't know if it works or not. I don't know. Dr. Dalvai, would you like to respond to what ma'am said? No, no, she is absolutely right because what I felt touched by that she said people like her have actually gone out and done those studies. It's not easy. And come out with all these things which are so important for our country. Uh -huh. My, what I feel bad is poor quality paper pe print hi-fi digital app. Pe ho. This is unfortunately the problem of consumerism today, marketing. So, it's a humble MCP card. It's available freely. I think what we could do is maybe all our members can just get a copy from the local municipal board close by. Put your copy at the same scene. Have you seen this? Mm -hmm. Do you know what good this idea. is? Yeah. Very good idea. The answer should be something that will help you know whether your child is doing well or no. That's it. Uh, Dr. Dalvai, there is a question from Khyati Sampar that even if I don't, you know, if even if I practice proper parenting, my child is going outside and he's seeing lots of things and he feels left out, particularly with respect to the screen time. And uh, what can one do? I mean, she finds herself, uh, you know, difficult to cope in face of peer pressure, so to say, which has started very young now. That's because when you do the right thing, you're always in a minority. Generally. Uh -huh. 
but you are doing the right thing and very often when you are in the minority but you are doing a right thing it's a dis a bit disconcerting but you have to ask yourself what is it that you are looking for your child to do better or you know looking at what does come uh, you know just some peers want for example if the child asks my peers are wearing a 15000 rupees nike or adidas shoes i may be able to afford 50 if i am not able to afford to baat hi nahi i may be able to afford should i buy it or should i not that is my value now if i want to buy it do i just oh, tujhe chahiye le le ye card le ja mujhe time mat waste kar or should i say okay but what do you i mean 15000 bucks why should i give you 15000 bucks what have you done to earn it so there are two ways of doing it at least it tells the child a concept that i have to earn something so there is a value lesson there and at the same time why do you need a 15000 rupees ka shoe boss usse kya fark padega that's the third way of looking at it so i can choose to be the parent that i am all three are right nothing is wrong but if you are trying to do something that is against the grain but if you are sure about it you should stick to it and you should tell your child the benefits of it but the other answer here is the best way to do it is you tell your child i'm not giving you the phone but i am there for you chal kya karna hai bol ghumne jana hai market jana hai ludo khelna hai cricket khelna hai gappe maarne hai gana gana hai dance karna hai chal karte hai your child will say nahi mujhe mobile nahi chahiye mujhe aap chahiye at at least till they become adolescents after that the story changes by that time we have laid a good enough foundation so we need not worry <laughs> so the child may not listen to you but the child knows and respects you so yeah. you have laid a good foundation that's it i think swati has also put it very nicely in the chat that we are not in a popularity contest with our children so something like that yeah rekha mene is asking uh, with respect to the parenting program that would your organization be open to the idea of beginning parent counseling program 100% okay so uh, rekha that's probably something that uh, aecd can plan towards or work towards with uh, dr dalvai as in his capacity as indian uh, association of pediatrics the coordinator of that work so i think that that's something that or, or with new horizons both yeah Yeah, or or with New Horizons. I mean, that's that's really that's really very good. Would anyone like to open uh, their mic, unmute themselves, and make any comments, observations, or any plans for the future? Can I make a yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to say, Doctor Dalwai, what a comprehensive presentation, really, and uh, so much to learn. But largely, I think uh, the lessons for. responsive parenting is something which i think we have to i think we as um, you know aecd people who also go and do a lot of workshops for parenting and all we also have to become very conscious of these small nuances that make a lot of difference to the responsive parenting which sometimes we make a very general kind of a workshop just trying to uh, tell them about importance of interaction but the kind of examples you gave where the interaction is lost in spite of the mother being there but it's not there correct that i think somewhere mm. even we have to understand that when we are training or going for parent workshops how conscious we have to be to bring out these nuances so that the parenting can become really more responsive the second thing i felt that very often today uh, working parents in in any uh, economic sector is can now little at least the middle class are aware about the 0 to 3 importance and all that and also about uh, interactions so the concerns they generally are that the child goes to daycare and large part of the day i don't work with the child i don't be with the child so how my how how is it impacting my child because i can't uh, guarantee that the daycare will give the interactions it has to give so that is one concern which parents have and i'll just put my other question also and then leave it to you and the other thing was uh, i feel when the uh, the there is interrelatedness of the health nutrition and parent responsiveness there is a need for rather than just having interventions we need to strengthen the parent uh, in the family's capability for child development 
And that can come only if you do nutrition security, only if you do income security, because directly then you are helping the parents to have the capacity to take care of the children rather than depend on the interventions, which is something which we have to link with what we are doing with the nurturance care framework. So these are my comments. I completely agree. Absolutely. So tell us something about how to explain to working parents about their... So I'll tell you what we did during COVID as COVID was getting over and uh, though people were at home, they were... So there is this Professor Ajay Gudavarti from JNU. You mm -hmm. might have wonderful guy. He's written so many articles and he comes over. He has come up with this concept called today the situation is living together but separately. Yeah. So he talks about it in context of communities but it's in terms of parenting also. Everybody is in their own silo. So we had mothers who said the same thing. Ki hum ghar se we are working well as from home, the child is right next door, in the next room or in the same room. How can you say I keep him away from the computer? And at the same time, how can I give him time? So we came up with this concept that if you're living in a tower or a big building as nowadays people are, a big society, there are usually seven, eight mothers to jate who have children of the same age group, roughly. Not exactly same a class, but maybe same age group. So we said, why don't you make a group as wide as possible, maybe six mothers or 12 mothers then decide that one day one of you will take half day off from work and all the kids will go to her house or his house, father also. And then that day you will decide what games the kids play and you will decide what food they will have or they can get their own food and potluck kind of thing. So you take off only once a week or if there are more children once in 15 days depending on the number of families involved. But the kids go from one house to the other house every day. So one is you take it off only once a week or once in 15 days. But the rest of the time you are you are free to do your own work. But the kids are learning far more than even you had given up your job and sat with them every day. Because they would lead, learn only from one mother and one culture. Somebody mentioned the word culture also sometime back. Yeah, you're right. From the same mother, same culture, same behavior, same. So that is where I am a big believer in Chachi, Masi, Bua, Mami. <laughs> so, 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 if the child goes to 12 different houses, one after the other, or six different houses in a week, he is going to become the next CEO of the company wherever he joins. Because he knows how to handle a Tamilian family, how to handle a Brahmin family, how to handle a Catholic family, how to handle a Malayalam, uh, a Kerala family, how to handle a Punjabi family. He becomes an expert in one year. He knows oh, Punjabi family mein jao to peri pona karna hai. You go to a Tamil family, kya karna hai? Oh, Marathi family, how oh, kaise kaise chal hai? This is what he really needs. And the ability to know what to say where. Well. This cannot be taught in a school or a class or a child development center. So the big problem, uh, ma'am, that I wanted to actually tell you, I'm thinking of writing a book on that, is all the entire environment uh, studies that we have on behavior and all, it's not clearly defined what behavior is. I mean, theoretically, yes. People think behavior for a child means how to do something or what to do, how to open the door, how to close the door, how to or what to. Real behavior is when to do it and when not to do it. This is my research. What to say and what not to say, uh, when to say and when not to say rather than what to say. So the real behavior is kab karna hai, kab ye nahi karna hai. Kab door kholna hai, kab door nahi kholna hai. How to open it and now we have these entire factories teaching children fine motor and eye hand coordination. You know who all are doing it. And making, laughing their way to the bank. So it is not about what to do. Behavior is not what to do. Behavior is when to do that thing and when not. And hence, there is a huge difference between skills and behaviors. Skills are what to do, how to do. How to do it quickly, how to do it better, how to do it efficiently, how to do it with less headache, less trouble, less cost, how to do skill. When to use that skill, when not to use that skill is behavior. And this cannot be taught by me, never. By my child development center, neurons, never. By the school, never. It can only be taught by keeping that child in that situation. Child is growing up, four or five month old child, bell bajti hai, maa jake darada khulti hai. Seven, eight month child is also seeing it. Doorbell bajti hai, to maa jake darada khulti hai. Doorbell nahi bajti hai, to maa nahi jake darada khulti hai. Khaane ka samay ho gaya, to father plates rakhe table pe. 
खा के हो गया तो उठा के सिंक में रख रहे हैं कब क्या करने का प्लेट रख के रखना उठाना ऑटिज्म कब लाना है कब नहीं लाना है नॉर्मल बिहेवियर सो दिस इज व्हाट आई फील इज दैट सो हम वी वी डिड दैट थिंग एंड देन दैट मदर केम बैक एंड टोल्ड बिकॉज शी वाज कमिंग टू अस फॉर सम हाइपर एक्टिविटी व्हाटएवर बट द अदर मदर्स वर दे वर फाइन सो शी सेड माय चाइल्ड इज इन फैक्ट गॉट बेटर एट इज हाइपर एक्टिविटी आल्सो व्हाई बिकॉज हाइपर एक्टिविटी इज नथिंग सम ट्यूमर इन द ब्रेन इट्स नॉट नोइंग व्हेन टू सिट क्वाइटली एंड इट्स नॉट नोइंग व्हेन टू रन अराउंड so she said he knows now he goes there he plays he knows the auntie comes she'll say abhi mat basti karo baitho shanti he'll sit quietly then he says okay theek hai abhi hum ja ke bahar masti kare ha jao khelo so the child learns self regulation social self regulation ki mujhe kaun se jagah pe kaisa behave karna hai main rekha ma'am ke ghar pe jaau to mujhe kaun sa type ka food milega aur mujhe kya dikhana hai ki mujhe acha lag gaya main vrinda ma'am ke ghar jaau udhar kya milega udhar bhi mujhe dikhana acha tha this is social self regulation which the child can only understand herself by being in these situations and looking at other children doing that but not by being made to sit down okay you have a developmental class today i do developmental activities for children nothing not not happening thank you so much fantastic differentiation between skill and behavior dr dalvai i think it's something that we can also include in our own uh, parenting literature that we write or produce or our own courses let's let's do a study on this yes and i mean i would be very happy because this is my original uh, you know observation and what we do at new horizons but yes. this needs to be converted into a study so it can get published yeah 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 we should do that i think it's uh, time to wind up now but there is still one question on the chat which i'm not really quite understanding by khyati sampath so if she wants to unmute and ask and maybe that's the last question of the day kathi you are asking about at the same time well informed parents following correct parenting often worry that what uh, if yes ma'am hello dr dalwai that was a fantastic um, uh, you know piece of information very very valuable thank you so much uh, what i meant was that you know while children go it's a good idea that you know they they go to different places they are their friends homes uh my question here is that you know at the same time if they are picking up right things they may be also be picking up wrong things um and sometimes then parent would wonder that you know i am doing everything right uh, you know that's that's possible in my capacity what if he picks up developmentally inappropriate habits his demands increase so how do i as a parent for instance uh how do i address uh, that concern that i have in my head a uh, very good question and at it does once you do this child is doing this it is of course after he comes back you are going to ask aaj kya kiya like you ask from school when the child comes back what did you do in school so he may say that i you know learned this uh, rika ma'am auntie told me this or the auntie is here pe ye kiya hota if you feel that he is picking up something that is inappropriate please remember that you are the mother and you are the final role model if you respond to it as a responsive caregiver rather than react to it that's extremely important so you hear something that you hear was not appropriate you don't react to it right away you wait for a day or two and then you discuss that issue with the child or you bring that issue up with the child of course depending on the developmental age of the child how old the child is and you may say that look this is what may be appropriate for them in a particular context in a particular situation it may be right for them so it's very important not to create oh ye wo log aise hi hain this is what is happening today unfortunately ye log aise hi hain rather than that it should be said ki theek hai it may be in their context right but our context is different so this part of it may not be appropriate for you the rest of it is fine so you are not creating a phobia or a homophobia in the part of the child's mind but you are saying that at the end of the day you have a right to decide what you want to pick up and what you not so look at the multiple benefits you have engaged a child with that you have brought up some topic you have enhanced your communication you have enhanced the trust between you and your child you are willing to look at what your child is telling you you are also introducing the child that look we judge people not we don't judge people we may look at a particular behavior but we have a choice our values tell us whether we need to do this or not and then we should practice that so you are going through the whole gamut of teaching you are teaching values you are teaching self regulation you are teaching cognition 
you're teaching social behavior. But if there is something which is completely objectionable, obviously you will bilaterally go and also speak to that parent and advise them that this may not be appropriate. And if it is something really terrible, you're seeing some domestic abuse happening in that house, somebody's beating up each other and all, then you can obviously decide not to send your child to that house. So it depends on the situation. And that's where responsive care parenting or caregiving rather than reactive caregiving comes in. I hope I've Thank you. Yes, that's an excellent perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalvai, for really speaking from your heart. And that is probably what has made all the impact. And whatever you've said has straight away connected to our hearts. So big thanks to you. And of course, thanks to all the participants. Do remember that soon we will be floating our flyer for the second webinar, which will be very important. It will be dealing with how nurturing care framework can be used, can be applied to children with disabilities, specifically with autism. And as you would have understood from this time, Dr. Samir Dalwai would be talking on the basis of experience and not just a knowledge based on the books. And so it would be very, very important for all of us in our own context as ECB professionals. So a big thank you to all the participants who have joined on the YouTube. We will be stopping the streaming on the YouTube now, Vaibhavi, and uh, Dr. Dalvai and all the people who have attended.